Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this week's virtual brown bag series. Today, we're going to hear from Kashav Sundaresh, who is with Altair. He's going to discuss how to apply systems thinking to become better at what you do. It's going to be great. I hope everybody's ready. Uh, some just some brief uh, housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the uh, presentation, go ahead and click on the chat icon in the top right of your screen. Type the questions into the chat. And we'll get to them as soon as possible. We'll have plenty of time to answer those questions. And I know he does want to hear from you. So please go ahead and be interactive. Talk to him. Let him hear what you're uh, what you're thinking. Um, just a brief background. Uh, Keshav Sundaresh is the Global Director of Smart Systems, Mechatronics and Robotics at Altair with over 15 years experience in multi-body multi dynamics, math and system, system simulation domains. In this role, he's responsible for technical and business thought leadership while driving the development of coupled software solution offerings to support the development of smart products and electro, electromechanical systems for clients. Easy for him to say, not so easy for me to say. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over. Keshav, go ahead. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, UTA, happy Friday. Uh, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to attend this virtual brown bag series or this presentation. I know that virtual e events are usually a little hard to pay complete attention to, and that's where you know I would really appreciate if you can try and interact with me, albeit through the Q&A window. So as Jeremy mentioned, um, this presentation would give you some hints and some ideas towards systems thinking, uh, what it means really, um, and why would it benefit you as a human being, and how has it been benefiting the industry in terms of solving complex uh, mechatronic systems or engineering problems. But before I get started and dive deeper on the presentation, um, I wanted to do a couple, um, you know, lay out a couple principles uh, that were given to me up front. So one of my colleagues, Hedison, who in fact referred me for this presentation, he worked with Ron and Tracy, and they were very clear in terms of what not to do uh, during the session. So. One of the uh, the key uh, guidelines that were given to me is to talk in layman's terms. Yes, I'm an engineer. Yes, I work for an engineering company. Uh, and yes, I work for a company that uh, develops simulation software. But you know, during the, the course of this presentation, I will try and not to bring in a lot of math or science or any sort of jargon, because as you can imagine, engineers love to uh, bring in a lot of terminologies and jargon. So I will try and keep that to minimum, as, as minimum as possible, and stay focused on the higher level or the, the big picture and what it means to you, uh, you know, as, a, as an individual or as an engineering um, student, or even just as a, as a person uh, wanting to learn something from this, uh, from this webinar. So with that said, you know, if I were to summarize my presentation in one slide about my own experience uh, applying systems thinking, here are three key things. Well, firstly, I have been applying systems thinking for about, uh, I would say, 15 to 20 years. Uh, I did not know that I was doing this when I was doing it. And, you know, of course, over uh, the last few years, and especially over the last year or so, I've had a lot of time to reflect on how I've been uh, using my intellectual ability and my emotional skills. So the first realization that I've had um, is that I have been applying systems thinking for a long time and it has helped me learn new subjects easier. Uh, and by easier, I just don't mean faster, but also more effectively. The uh, second takeaway, at least for me personally, is that it has helped me break down or distill down complex technical problems into clear chunks and link these clear chunks into actionable value propositions. And once again, I will show you through some specific examples on what I mean by all of this in the, uh, in the due course of this presentation. And the, the third 
key realization that I've had um, or the benefit that I've gained personally with systems thinking is that it has helped me influence multiple stakeholders um, while not having a direct authority. So as you can imagine, in the industry or I guess just in the corporate um, world, generally speaking, you would undertake a lot of um, responsibility to deliver on projects, to you know work on complex problems and so on and so forth. But while you have responsibility, you may not necessarily have direct authority. So there is an art and there is also a little bit of science towards how to influence people to get things done, to work towards a common goal or a shared goal and essentially make the world a better place. And so the third realization that I've had is that it has really helped me become a strong independent contributor while still making everyone happy and satisfied and, and successful. Now, once again, before I continue on and sharing some of these ideas uh, specifically with you, I wanted to just you know play with, um, I guess, the acronym UTA, um, University of Texas at Arlington. So if you were to um, write down three things from this presentation today, Okay, um, in terms of how systems thinking will help you. In my opinion, systems thinking will help you UTA. And, and let's see if you can remember this. Systems thinking will help you understand and develop a better view of, of, your, of your own. Um, I've, I've said a comprehensive worldview, and by that I essentially mean you, you have a, a slightly bigger and a broader mindset to looking at the world, to looking at just yourself, and to looking at problems, uh, largely speaking. So that's you. Uh, T, systems thinking will help you tackle complex problems and situations, not just efficiently, but effectively. So by effectiveness, I mean the quality, the reliability with which you can uh, tackle situations. So. Understand and develop a comprehensive worldview of your own. Tackle complex, uh, complex problems and situations effectively. And number three, A, apply yourself better, especially when faced with, with difficult situations. Um, so once again, I'm, I'm going to try and quiz you uh, once every now and then throughout the next whatever 45, 50 minutes and see if you remember these three key takeaways. UTA understand, tackle, and apply. Okay, so let, let me jump to the agenda now. Um, I was reflecting over the past uh, several weeks in terms of what are some ideas, what are some um, recipes and frameworks that I can share with you without being really technical or without really going uh, deep on the math and science uh, concepts. So I essentially boil it down to five questions. The first question that I want to try and answer is, what do I mean by systems thinking? What is a system and why is it important? Um, and what are some examples of systems thinking? The, uh, the second question that I want to tackle is, why use this framework or why use systems thinking largely speaking? And the third uh, sets of framework are the how questions. So how is the industry applying systems thinking uh, to solve real world problems? And in this context, we can also look at how several entrepreneurs and leaders uh, across the globe have been using this framework to take better decisions, to take reliable decisions, number one. Number two, how have I been personally applying systems thinking? What, what are some lessons that I've learned um, that, that I can share with you, right? And last but not the least, I wanna leave you with some specific ideas, some specific tools and methods that you can use today in, in whatever role uh, you're in or in whatever, I guess, um, job uh, that you're asked to do or whatever thing that you wanna study. So how can you apply systems thinking? So these are my five guiding principles for uh, the next 45 minutes. Let me, uh, let me start with the first one. 
what is uh, systems thinking? Okay, and before I get into the, the thinking part, let me first try and describe what a system is. So a system uh, is a collection of parts which interact with each other to function as a whole. So it's not just one part or two parts or three parts. It could be you know, as many number of parts as you can imagine, but there is some sort of a causality or a directional sense and an interconnectedness that makes the whole thing or that makes the whole thing function in a specific manner. Let me give you an example. So I'm sure uh, some of you, if not all of you, would have uh, flown, uh, you know, in a, on a, in a in an aircraft or on a plane. So if you look at the landing gear system of an aircraft, you have, for instance, the the strut of the landing gear. You have the various uh, tires, and you have the various brackets that are all connected up to the the main structure, and there are various events that the landing gear has to go through, you know, such as retraction, um, such as a drop, uh, such as taxiing from, you know, the gate to the runway and, and vice versa. So this landing gear is essentially a collection of different mechanical, electrical and controls parts and hydraulics parts, which interact with each other to function as a whole in terms of being able to maneuver you or you know, I guess carry the, the payload of the aircraft from one place to one another, right? Here's another example, uh, perhaps a, an even simpler one. So if you look at a car, you know, car has several different parts, right? It has a steering, it has uh, suspensions, it has tires, it has a, a powertrain. It has an engine. Um, it has various types of panels and um, body and closure systems, latch mechanisms, a hood, and so on and so forth. If you, if I were to just give you a car seat and say, "Hey, here's your car. Go, you know, drive around," I don't think you'll be able to. If I just give you the tire or the tires of a car and say, "Here, you know, go." go from, I don't know, uh, from where you are in Arlington to uh, the airport. I don't think you'd be able to do that. So when you essentially collect all these parts, combine them or connect them in such a way that it meets a certain function, which is to transport or which is to take you from one place to another in the safest possible manner uh, with higher reliability, then you're looking at an automotive a system or an automobile as a whole. So that's what I mean uh, essentially as a system uh, as a system. Now a system also has a certain set of principles um, or, or properties. So the first property uh, of the system is that in order for the system to do the job that it's uh, set to do, all of the parts that you indicate to be part of the system must be present, number one, and they must be arranged in a proper way. So if you take yourself, you know, the human being, a human body is a fantastic biological system. Uh, you know, but without the heart, your lungs won't function. Um, and, you know, without the blood flowing in uh, throughout your body, your um, your muscles essentially won't be able to give you all the various um, uh, an anatomy and the uh, and, and and the various things that you want to do as a, as a human being. So similarly, um, any physical system that you can see around you, in order for these uh, physical systems to do its job, all the parts that are set out to have the final product. Uh, first of all, they must be present. And second of all, they must be arranged in a specific way or in the proper way. Now, Dr. Russell, uh, he's one of the leading thinkers um, and one of the, you know, one of my inspirations anyway. Um, he has written several books around uh, systems thinking. 
And he gives a, a very interesting example of how um, uh, a system can be defined. He uh, takes the example of uh, a car. And he says that, you know, if you take 200 of the best cars that are out there today, right? And you, you bring all these cars into a, a huge garage. And then you hire, let's say, the best engineers to come and to inspect every part of these 200 cars and pick the best parts. For instance, you might go to BMW or you would find a BMW car and you, you might want to pick the engine from the BMW. You might want to pick the, uh, the front and rear suspensions from, let's say, a Porsche. Uh, you might want to pick uh, the steering system from a Ford um, vehicle and so on and so forth. So if you end up picking these individual parts and if you try to assemble a car from all these best parts that you pick out, you won't be able to get a car because these parts together won't fit in the in the first place. So again, in order for a system to do its job, all the parts have a specific function and they must all fit together and be arranged in a proper way in order for it to do its mission. There is there is a third property to, uh, to systems and that is um, if, if something is made up of just a sheer number of parts and it does not matter um, how these parts are arranged, then you're not necessarily dealing with a system. Uh, it's essentially a collection of objects or what Dr. Kaufman refers to as a heap and, and not necessarily a system. Here's an example. Um, if you were to take milk, OK, and if you were to add more milk to the milk that's already in a pail, it would just give you a larger amount of milk. So milk like sand or soil, it is not a system because it doesn't matter how these parts are arranged. So it's essentially a heap or just a collection of things, right? While on the other hand, if you take a cow, OK, adding another cow to the one you already have uh, does not necessarily give you a larger cow. Now, if I were to take my uh, pail of milk and if, uh, if I were to divide that into two portions, I would have two different cups of milk. But I cannot take a cow, cut it in half, and expect to have two cows uh, either. So again, there is a a subtle but an important difference between what you call a collection of objects and a system. Now let's take a relationship. A relationship between two people. You know, it could be a mom, daughter, or mom and son, or a, you know, a dad and the son, dad, daughter, or the relationship that you have, you know, with with yourself as a student, with your professor, or the relationship between two people, um, you know, in a, in a romantic way. You have two choices. You could either look at this relationship in a very objectified manner, right? Where you're just looking at someone as a collection of things or possessions, materialistic possessions. Or you can look at someone in the context of also having emotion and empathy and looking at the person with kindness. So once again, a subtle drift, but an important difference is that when you, um, look at a system, the, the way the parts are arranged and, and the way the interconnectedness work is unique uh, compared to just a collection of parts. What else? Um, the fourth, but one of the most principles of systems and systems thinking is that in, in any system, it, it could be a wind turbine, it could be a car, it could be an excavator, it could be a, you know, a watch, a smart watch that you might be using or even a phone, uh, a smartphone that you might be using today. When you perform an improvement of, on the parts taken separately, that does not automatically guarantee that the performance of the whole, that is when all these parts are connected together, would necessarily improve. 
And, you know, from our experience in the industry, more often than not, it actually gets worse. So most of us have this siloed um, approach to, uh, to thinking and to doing our own jobs. Um, we call that vertical thinking. You know, for instance, if you're a mechanical engineer, you are you only care about the mechanical systems integrity or the mechanical performance. If you are an electrical engineer, you think in your own silo in terms of being able to look at some of the metrics and some of the outputs that are important to perform well in that electrical engineering role. But the world is a little bit more interconnected uh, than just being siloed out. So while you might be thinking of doing the best with whatever silo that you have set yourself out to, it's very important to look a little broader, consider all factors, consider the interconnectedness and the relationship or the causality between a mechanical system and an electrical system, for instance, or between the mind and your body, or between the heart, the mind, and your body, for instance, and try and optimize the overall system uh, so that you have a better chance of being successful so that you have a so that you stand a greater chance of uh, providing a holistic experience to to the community the example that i have here is of a wind turbine so on the one hand you can tear open a wind turbine to its uh, you know constituent parts like a nacelle which has a planetary gearbox like the tower on which the, the wind turbine has to stand on a, on a platform, like the individual blades. Um, and you can optimize these individual parts, but that doesn't guarantee that when you assemble this wind turbine together and then put it on the field, um, it would give you maximum power. Because once again, you've only optimized the individual components and not necessarily the entire system as a whole. So that, that was my first bet. I know I've been talking for about 22 minutes. Uh, Jeremy, are there any questions uh, so far? Uh, did you receive anything on the, on the Q&A? Not in the Q&A, but I actually have a question. So it, is it possible then, is it to, like you were talking about the wind turbine, is it possible to improve a system strictly by um, improving each of the component parts, or do you always have to just combine, just look at the system as a whole to improve the entire system? If the system is going to function as a whole when you release it, so if, if you have to drive a car and if you want the car to go from zero to 60 miles per hour in under three seconds, then just testing the engine and its performance in and of itself is not enough. So you ought to be able to understand right from the concept level how all these mechanical, electrical, and control systems come together as a whole to satisfy a certain set of requirements that you initially set out to uh, with, with your product and, and whatever you know those requirements could be. So optimizing the system as a whole is as important and arguably is more important than just optimizing the individual components that go into the system. Interesting. So basically you would be look you would if you're testing something, you're testing the entire system first, and then you determine which points you need to fix and then fix them that way instead of saying, well, I'm going to get the max out of this part and this part and this part, and that's going to make everything better. Like you need to look at the whole first and then look at the component parts. Absolutely. Interesting. Um, form follows function uh, is, uh, is, is one of the major learning uh, I had when I joined the industry. So I, I'm a trained mechanical engineer, right? So I went through a lot of uh, computer-aided design and uh, computer-aided engineering uh, software tools um, you know, during my training. And I was always taught to think in terms of form. So if someone came to me and they said, hey, can you design a new suspension for me for a car? I would say no problem. And I would just jump into a, a computer-aided design software, a CAD tool, a three-dimensional CAD tool, and start sketching out how the new suspension should look like. But if the suspension cannot achieve the, um, the function that it's supposed to, which is to eliminate the, uh, the road noise, right? 
between the road and the passenger, then I might design the best suspension, but it might not function to the uh, that uh, you set it out for. Form follows function. So understand the function first before you get into the form. Thank you. And just while you're stopped, I will encourage anybody that's any of our attendees that has a question, go ahead and type it into the Q&A. And as you can see, we'll be stopping here from time to time and we'll, we'll get those questions answered. Thank you. I'm curious, you know, do you still remember uh, the play of uh, words here? Do you still remember what UTA means? Uh, you know, if, if you do, please uh, type it in the chat window and whoever gets uh, the right answer. I will personally spend an hour with you and listen to you and, and help you out in however I can. OK, uh, Jeremy, should we move on to the next uh, item? In the sure, agenda? let's go ahead and move on and give people a chance to think back and remember. OK, great. So I think I've already emphasized enough about um, systems and the ability to or the necessity to think uh, in terms of systems. Throughout my summary uh, in, the, in the first few slides, I also gave you certain reasons as to why thinking in terms of systems is important for you as an individual, but also why it is important to think in terms of systems when you work within an industry in whatever role you might be. I've, I've tried um, and, and once again, you know, I there are lots of interesting books uh, around this and I can also suggest some of this um, either by the by the end of the session today or you know if you connect with me on LinkedIn or send me an email or whatever I'd be happy to share more information with you but I've, I've tried to distill down five key things that has helped me uh, understand the importance of why I needed to use systems thinking the first realization I had is systems thinking in a nutshell has helped me understand to think big and to think broader. What do I mean by this? More often than not, we all care about our own problems and we all care about just getting our job done um, and silo ourselves down to our own sort of swim lane, if that makes sense to you. Sometimes in order for you to perform on your job really well, it's important to take a step back and put it in context to how your work is going to be used in a, you know, as part of a larger organization or, you know, generally speaking in terms of just solving a larger problem for humanity or um, for, for mankind um, overall. So when you think in terms of systems, you have the ability to, to, to take a natural step back and focus on the whole, as I mentioned in my previous slides, and have a better understanding of what you're getting into, number one. Now, because you have a better understanding, it leads to my second point. You would be in a position to have a holistic view of your role, of yourself, and also how you're helping others. Now, this is from a, just a personal uh, standpoint, but if you join an organization as a mechanical engineer or a chief engineer or an electrical engineer or a controls engineer, etc., you would have a holistic understanding of how not just your thing works, but how the actual system works. Number three, I think the world we live in revolves around assumptions. Um, when when we especially make our faces visible through whatever Zoom calls and Teams uh, meetings and so on and so forth. When we see someone, you know, uh, pretending to be angry, we think that that person is angry. When we see someone who we think uh, has a big smile on his or her face, we think that the person is happy. But uh, more often than not, having this systems thinking approach doesn't lead you to immediately fall onto assumptions and think that the world is black and white. It allows you to reflect. It allows you to consider all factors and take a sound decision for, you know, for, for various situations. And I'll talk a little bit more about this subsequently. Uh, the fourth thing is that I think we all do a great job being efficient with, uh, with what we do, largely speaking. I mean, with the advent of computers, 
uh, it has already automated so many different uh, things for us. Um, you know, be it uh, automating the home um, en environment uh, through products like Alexa and and Siri and so on and so forth. But you also have the ability to automate several different engineering things with the evolution of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. But I think where systems thinking would help you is not just in terms of efficiency through automation, but effectiveness in terms of the quality and the reliability with which you can make an impact to whatever little uh, role uh, that you want to participate in. The fifth reason why I think systems thinking is important is actually a, a chapter that I read from uh, this book called The Signal in the Noise from Nate Silver. And in, in, in this chapter, I mean, um, Nate goes into a lot of mathematical or statistical details um, to show or to describe how to become less and less and less wrong. So yeah, systems thinking, and because you're considering all factors upfront before you start doing things, it essentially allows you to make fewer mistakes. I mean, we all make mistakes. I do make mistakes on a, on a daily basis or on a very regular basis, but it helps you minimize the maximum number of mistakes that uh, that you might make in a project or that you might make in a relationship or that you might make in just how you think about yourself. So it helps you become less and less and less wrong. Okay. So let, let's take some examples. Um, so I, I spoke a little bit about systems thinking and why it's important. We have lots of uh, roles within the industry uh, and specific titles called systems engineers who apply, they're more or less, you know, consider them as product managers or project managers. So they have this cross-functional role and they have the job or the responsibility to extract meaning and, and knowledge from every single silo that they, um, you know, that they work with. So let, let's take a few examples. Now, you know, back to Jeremy's question that he asked earlier about the wind turbine performing as a whole versus not being able to perform if you just optimize the individual parts. I know that this graph can be a little involved. Um, this is the only complex slide I have, so please bear with me on this one. But if you ask a simple question, and that is, how do people design new products? And by products, I essentially mean people in the manufacturing industry that develop mechatronic systems, mechanical plus electronic systems, like a car, an aircraft, uh, you know, a spaceship, um, uh, you know, a watch, uh, so on and so forth. They essentially go through about five major phases. So there is something called as a concept stage where you look at, you know, the form, then you go through a detailed design you then uh, create some physical prototypes and then you go through production. You then assemble the whole thing uh, together and then you go through uh, what they call the test integration and certification process. And then they release the product to the market. And depending on the market fluctuations or the market, uh, the customer uh, feedback or complaints as the case may be, you go through a certain set of in-service, you know, warranty um, and uh, service uh, requirements. Now, it, the graph that you see here essentially talks about the cost of fixing a newly discovered design error. So let's say, for instance, you're designing a car. And if you were to just um, ignore understanding how the entire system works at the concept level because you're you're in a hurry you just want to develop these individual parts optimize them and you know get it get it to production and then have the test and the integration teams assemble the car and test it out in a in a proving ground for various types of events such as you know a pothole a rough road a cobblestone road and so on and so forth what you would notice is that the cost that it takes to fix a newly found error or an issue during the later stages of a product development is significantly high. 
I mean, if it took you one dollar to design something at the concept level, if you found an error at the at the test and integration level, you would have to essentially spend 40 times more than amount to fix it. And even worse, if you found this error after you have launched the vehicle to the market and people start complaining, it takes you 250 times more. So the most important uh, thing here is to look at quality and understanding the the overall performance or the overall function of the system before you start going deeper into assigning a form or you know getting into detailed designs so the major solution for this problem and by, by the way this problem is across all original equipment manufacturers automotive aerospace heavy equipment electronics shipbuilding you name it uh, oil and gas wind energy so the solution is to apply systems thinking not at the in service level not at the physical you know test and integration level but right at the concept design level so that you make less and less and less mistakes or errors so here are a couple examples so if you take uh, the automotive industry and there are several companies that um, leverage physics based simulation environments to understand to first of all model uh, analyze review and improve the overall system so in this case you are looking at an electric car this is a personal mobility car uh, this is meant to essentially uh, drive you within uh, within a city uh, so it's a personal mobility car and what you're seeing is on the left hand side you have a simulated reality and on the right hand side you have the physical experiment meaning the physical test that was created or that was tested after they produced these uh, individual designs now what you see here is something really you know in my opinion incredible you have been able to use simulation as a means to understand how the system works right at the concept level before you designed anything and before you tested anything here's another example uh, this is uh, from the uh, industrial uh, robotics space so here you have um, let's say you want to develop an exoskeleton an exoskeleton essentially gives you superpowers um, in order for you to be able to lift things easily uh, that uh, which otherwise would be very difficult for you to lift on your own now how do you go about designing an exoskeleton like this you know on the one hand um, on the one hand you could uh, design these individual parts of the of the exoskeleton you know these various mechanical linkages you could design the electric motors again as individual parts. You can optimize them on at, as its uh, own thing, but where it adds real value is in terms of wrapping the exoskeleton on the human being and doing events, motion capture events that is otherwise you know unable to test out. Um, and so here you see the human machine interaction of an exoskeleton and the comparison between doing it at the concept level versus trying to create the same experience with a, with a physical experiment. Here's uh, another example from robotics. So here you see a six degree of freedom robot. And once again, um, using physics based simulation methods, you have the ability to understand the system performance the system could be a mechanical system or the system could be any mechatronic system. I think I'm getting a little repetitive. You see where I'm going with this. So if you look at the aerospace industry um, and once again, if you take the landing gear as an example, there are several aerospace engineers that essentially make sure that the product behaves just as mentioned in the in the catalog. In other words, it meets the functions or the requirements that 
were shared with the customer as uh, you know as part of the data sheet or as part of the release notes document and how they go about doing it well right at the concept stage once again they use systems thinking through simulation through system simulation heavy equipment uh, another example so here you have let's say you wanted to design an excavator and you want to test the performance of the excavator as it dug different types of materials you know uh, an iron ore versus coal versus sand and so on and so forth so what you could do once again using a physics based simulation approach is to be able to model not just the individual parts but how these parts combine together to become a an excavator system with the arm the boom the bucket the various hydraulic actuators and then you could also model the the bulk material you know the the coal or the iron ore uh, materials and then go through the the system dynamics or the time evolution of the system as it's digging through various types of uh, materials and understand the corresponding forces that come onto the system and use these forces as a means to improve on your individual parts w one more example uh, I, i believe this is the last example i have from the, the real world uh, problem so this is a uh, this is from a uh, the energy um, uh, vertical so here you see a wind turbine a, you know a full wind turbine assembly um, going through a simulation where you are simulating real world scenarios or real world events such as let's say you want to apply an emergency brake how would the structure and how would the entire system behave when you apply an emergency brake to a wind turbine how would the blades flex how would the controller perform how would the uh, the brake pressure uh, essentially change uh, what would the yaw uh, be on the uh, or the yaw rate change on the system and so on and so forth so once again using simulation as an enabler we have several engineers in the industry applying systems thinking through system simulation okay well hopefully that gave you a, a you know a glimpse into how the industry is applying systems thinking i can go into a whole lot more details on this if you are interested please just feel free to contact me i can also share more uh, engineering uh, specific white papers on this but before i proceed uh, i know that i've once again been talking for about 15 20 minutes here jeremy how are we doing uh, do you did you receive any responses uh, do you have any questions um i have not received any responses and there are no questions at the moment so i think now am i is it understand think are those the u and the t uh i'm i'm sorry could could you repeat that uh u and t is that understand and think i'm trying to remember myself so i understand tackle and apply tackle and apply all right thank you i couldn't remember myself <laughs> okay well i'm going to bring this up in the end also um i should have spent more time on that now that you say uh, that jeremy or maybe i should have uh, allowed you to take a screenshot whatever okay Sh should i move on to the uh, the next topic then absolutely please okay so now that you've got a, a little glimpse into how the industry has been applying systems thinking um let me quickly go through uh, a few lessons that i've personally learned um again uh, consciously or subconsciously uh, using systems thinking you know the, the first lesson uh, that i've um, learned uh, throughout the last you know several uh, years is that applying contextual thinking or systems thinking has just helped me get better feedback get a better understanding of how things work and also it has helped me overcome what i call the uh, the illusions of uh, competence so in 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 the past i used to gloss over a lot of the material uh, that i needed to learn but i would never practice i would never you know solve a problem on my own i would just look at how other people have solved uh, these problems and very quickly i realized that 
there are five things that you cannot teach someone. You cannot teach people experience. You cannot teach people common sense. Uh, you cannot teach people uh, yeah, confidence. You cannot teach people anything that they uh, don't want to learn. And you cannot teach people anything if they know it all. So this made me reflect a little bit more in terms of how I want to always stay curious and go above and beyond in terms of not just being at a superficial level in terms of understanding things, but really get to the bottom of it by by learning, by trying to teach what I've learned with, with others um, and, and so on and so forth. So th there is this, you know, the four lines that I've written on the slide. Uh, th this is uh, once again from Dr. Russell Akoff. Um, and he says, and he has said it beautifully, you know, an ounce of information is worth a pound of data. An ounce of knowledge is worth a pound of information. Um, and so I was actually in the first two steps when I was doing my engineering, uh, when I was studying myself, I was overwhelmed with a lot of information and and some knowledge too. But I had very little to no time to really understand it because I was not solving problems on my own, nor was I spending time beyond my um, beyond my curriculum to understand these things. So when I again learned it the hard way that I need to solve this on my own, it helped me improve my experience. It helped me get a better, um, you know, gain better confidence. It also gave me some common sense um, because I'm no longer relying on my illusion of competence, but actually based on first-hand experience. Okay, um, the second thing that I learned is to understand um, how my mind works in terms of patterns, number one but also to have a deeper connection to the things that I do um, on, a, on a daily basis. So more often than not, in the past, when I joined the industry, I was really focused on proving myself at work. I was really focused on bringing my best self and doing the best job possible. But, and, and there were times and there were days when I used to spend, I don't know, 16, 17, 18 hours non-stop now you know life is in equilibrium so the more i spend time just being one dimensional with my work i realized that i was not necessarily spending enough time with my family with my parents uh, with my sister so i realized that life is not just about applying yourself um, purely from a performance uh, strengths perspective it, it is you know very important for me it gives me a lot of satisfaction but at the end of the day, it is also how I treat people. It is also how I try to be respectful and how I try to truly care for people and genuinely try and help them is, is where I get my maximum satisfaction. So again, systems thinking helped me come to this realization because it gave me a better perspective to who I am and gave me a, a better understanding of the worldview. Now, I've, I've quoted uh, Peter Drucker uh, here, where he says that there is a big difference, not a subtle, but a big difference between doing things right and doing the right thing. Um, and, you know, I've learned once again the hard way uh, that this difference is absolutely true. Um, and if you try to devote more and more time doing the wrong thing right, and the writer, you do the wrong thing, the wronger you end up uh, becoming. So. Being more mindful um, and essentially caring for everyone that you work with and truly caring for people uh, is, is, is important. Uh, the third realization I've had uh, personally uh, in terms of applying systems thinking is uh, just the sheer ability to have a holistic understanding of things that I can control and things that I cannot control. So there have been times in the past even when I was studying, where I used to procrastinate. And part of the reason why I was doing that is because somehow I didn't feel good or I had this negative feeling, uh, either because I was not clear on the scope or because uh, I was just not feeling um, great from within. So one of the, again, practices that I have 
um, put forth as an intention almost on a daily basis is to try and reduce misery. In other words, try and um, not have these mental formations of anger, judgment, uh, delusion, and, and despair. Uh, so that I have the best intention and my only intention is to not be a sloth. My only intention is to truly care for the world and the customers and the, and the people that I work with and try and maximize how reliable I am just as an individual. So focusing my time, energy and attention on the right goals and on the right projects uh, has helped me become a better human being um, through systems thinking. One last thing on this. In the past, I had this thing that, well, I was always flooded with a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, and I used to spend days just answering emails. Um, and I realized that answering emails and phone calls is not necessarily deep work. It doesn't give me, it, it doesn't help me impact the world in, you know, in, in deeper ways. So I've, I've tried to be a little bit more mindful and picky, if you will, in terms of how I want to use my time and how I want to use my energy in, in doing meaningful things. Okay, um, we have, I think, about nine minutes here. Um, uh, Jeremy, are there any questions? Does this make sense to you? Do you see where I'm going with this? I absolutely do. I have a question for you later um, because it, you might actually answer my question in this next section. So, um, but there are no questions from the audience at the moment. Okay. But, uh, folks, if you do have questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A spot. You'll, you'll be happy to answer. Absolutely. All right. So I, I know that I've crammed in a lot of information uh, for you within, uh, you know, for 45 minutes or so. So I've learned a lot about systems thinking. Uh, there are a lot of different frameworks that I want to share with you, but because we don't have so much time, I, I try to prioritize the top two or the top three ideas uh, that I want to share with you as recipes. Um, the first, uh, you know, recipe or an idea or a framework that I highly recommend uh, you do is to take this course on Coursera uh, called Learning How to Learn. This is a highly systemic and an extremely well conducted course. It's it's free um, and it gives you a really good framework into how to really learn as opposed to going around with this illusion of competence in terms of thinking that you've learned while you've never tried, while you've never experimented yourself. So there is this concept of chunking and linking these chunks in a uh, in a metaphorical way or using analogies for you to be able to remember, for you to be able to associate um, things and so on and so forth. So if you are still in you know the stage of learning while you're still studying, I suggest you go through this course. Um, gives you an excellent framework to break down a system such as a new subject that you want to learn into the corresponding chunks, associate these chunks to some sort of a, a real world or even to some parts of your own life even, and go through contextual thinking. Now, part of this course um, also goes through something called as the, uh, the habit uh, cycle or the habit circle. Um, and once again, there's been a lot of books published on this, but just to quickly tell you, um, the habit circle has three different stages. So you have a certain set of triggers. You know, the triggers could be you're at a specific location or you're uh, with someone or, uh, you know, you're, you're doing something. And for instance, if you're working long days, your routine then could be drink lots of coffee or eat a lot of unhealthy food. Um, and the reward that you get in return is some sort of a, a you know, a simple satisfaction. Um, or a belief within you thinking that, okay, you know, you're going to be awake because you're drinking lots of coffee. And so or not, we get into this uh, subconscious cycle of um, creating, uh, forming habits on our own. And they say that in order for you to overcome uh, these habits or create new habits, there is only one thing and one thing that uh, you need to do. And that is 
change your reaction to the cue or to the trigger. And I've been really mindful of, first of all, being self-aware of my own habits, number one, as an individual. But two, um, I've also been going out of my comfort zone and pushing myself to do better or become better, uh, a better version of myself. And once again, whenever there have been negative feelings about a certain project or about a certain uh, thing that I want to take on, I try to um, just change that feeling uh, and look for a small starting point. It, it could be just taking a paper and writing down the goals, or it could be just taking, I don't know, an idea generation environment like PowerPoint, for instance, or Word, and just starting something that has helped me change my reaction to the queue and essentially cultivate better habits. So the head trash, what you think, I mean, that's why the, you know this presentation is all about systems thinking. What you think ultimately matters because what you think you become. So change your thoughts, uh, stay positive, have more positive affirmations. And I'm sure uh, once you have a constructive mindset, you will find ways to um, become become just a better person and a better thinker. The second framework that I want to share with you is um, from someone by the name Dr. Edward De Bono. And back in the day, you know, when I did my uh, Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, I did not uh, have access to this Coursera course on learning how to learn, but. I had access to Dr. Edward De Bono's work on thinking and um, generally speaking on creativity and, and lateral thinking. I've read several of his books. Uh, there are several different frameworks that he uh, proposes, but one such framework that I think will help you um, quite significantly is the six thinking hats framework. Now, as you know, the name suggests, uh, you basically you know, wear these metaphorical hats and think in a specific direction. For me, the biggest realization to systems thinking over the past few years, especially in my professional life, has been to know how to ask the right questions, to be able to get the right answers and to make progress in the, you know, you know, in a, in a right way. So asking questions is easy, but asking the right questions takes a little bit more practice, a little bit more reflection, and, and I guess a little bit more um, collaborative uh, exercise. So the six thinking hats framework allows you to do this naturally. So, you know, if you look at the white hat, for instance, again, these hats are specific directions uh, with which you, you want to be thinking uh, when you have a specific problem or a specific objective statement written down, right? So the white hat thinking essentially poses a neutral framework. Um, it only focuses on the facts at hand and some of the, uh, you know, the believed facts versus checked facts that you have access to. And then there are a series of questions that you can ask to gather this information. And I've, I've tried to list this down here. I will also make this presentation available to you um, through your uh, UTA virtual brown bag series website. So you can go through this on your own and, and, and try this out. And by the way, there is also a book uh, by Edward De Bono, uh, Dr. Edward De Bono on six uh, hats thinking, if you want to buy that. So red hat thinking uh, falls into um, uh, taking out some of the, uh, the background emotions uh, that you might have before getting into a project. So things like how cold or how warm do you feel about working with someone or working on a specific project and how are you feeling about this and how are you reacting um, organizational psychology is as important as uh, you know executing on a technical project so red hat thinking essentially gives you uh, the ability to sort of vent out if you will and just put the emotions on paper excuse me kesha um, we do actually have a question in the chat and we're also coming up on time. So I, I don't mean to interrupt you because it's really interesting stuff and I'm learning a lot, but I, want, I do want to make sure we get to this question before uh, people Absolutely. might have to leave. Um, Israel asks, how did you get past glossing over information and procrastination? 
these are so badly ingrained in my academic life that it seems like even when I get out of it for a little, I go right back to it as soon as I find something else I like doing more. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Israel, great question. Um, happy Friday to you, first of all. I think the the key um, the key word is consistency and discipline. So first of all, you ought to believe that you can change and that you can make a, a small but an important change to yourself. Second, you ought to believe that by doing this change, you will become a better person. You will become more successful. And third is to keep reminding yourself every day. So I usually start my day by writing down my intentions. And every time my head wants to snap to the past, I go back and I read my intention. My intention is to become better. So I, I try to trick my brain, if you will, to focus on creating this new discipline. And there have been several studies, Israel, uh, that people have done. It, it, you know, Some say that in order for you to create a new habit, you ought to do it for 66 days or you know, two months plus every single day. And then there are some uh, studies that also say that you know you ought to be able to do this for 30 days straight so that it becomes you know a natural habit to you so it's it, it boils down to keeping up with the motivation setting the right intention and making sure that you're consistent for a specific period of time a month 60 days what have you and once you do that i'm sure you'll uh, uh, you know climb the hill but then you will start uh, racing I hope I answered your question, uh, Israel. OK, well, it looks like we've uh, completely uh, run out of time here, so maybe I, sh I should stop here, uh, Jeremy. Sure, I, I, can, I can share this presentation with you uh, uh, later on, but that's what I wanted to share with the group today. I'm once again very grateful for everyone's uh, time, energy, and attention. So UTA. Absolutely. Thank you, Keshav. Uh, it, it was a great presentation. I personally learned a lot from it, and uh, I'm glad that Israel was able to get his question answered. Um, and we appreciate you taking the time to speak to us today, also for sharing your slides so that people can go back and look and, and take a little bit more time with this than we actually had um, um, today in person. Um, our next week is our last week of the virtual brown bag series for the semester, so come back on Friday, April 30th for our last show. Uh, again, Keshav, thank you very much. And everybody, I hope you have a great weekend and a great week ahead. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, everyone.